So good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Marine Diversity Education Series on arthropods. So today we will be learning about arthropods as well as echinodermata. So first we'll go with arthropods. So arthropods, uh, they represent the most uh, successful group of animals in the animal kingdom. Uh, almost 75% of all identified animals, they belong to this phylum. So they, they are the largest. So several factors contributed uh, for them to um, occupy the spaces in Earth, like in atmosphere, and water, and the land. So they, uh, they predominantly live in these environments. So the factors um, are like, uh, we can say for their hard exterior and joint appendages, and sophisticated uh, sense organs. Um, these factors contributed for them to uh, venture all these um, environments. So here you can see clearly um, how the hard uh, protective exterior skeleton uh, of uh, them, of these arthropods, are composed uh, and also especially we need to uh, know that these uh, exterior skeletons are made up of uh, polysaccharide called uh, chitin and also in many uh, marine uh, species the skeleton is uh, impregnant uh, that means they are mixed with calcium salt to give an extra strength so with chitin we can um, we can observe calcium salt as well. So the exoskeleton is flexible enough uh, in regions of joints. So it, it has a, a like exoskeleton which is outward the body, but uh, in in appendages like they have the joint appendages. Okay. So in those areas, uh, these exoskeleton they become flexible enough to move their uh, joints, okay? And it improves uh, points of attachment for muscles. So uh, there's a special thing that we should know about this exoskeleton. They provide space for muscle attachment as well. So this exoskeleton does uh, have its drawbacks. So however, because the exoskeleton exoskeleton is not a living it does not grow with the animal so that's a, a thing that uh, like when when the organism they grow uh, these exoskeletons they don't grow further so they are shed so yes here in this picture you can see how this shrimp uh, has shed its outer skeleton so as the animal grows it must shed its old exoskeleton and produce a new one so then only it can accommodate so it can allow the uh, species or the, the organisms to grow more so this process is called molting the exoskeleton shedding uh, process is called molting as the skeleton increases in size, so does it weight, making it more difficult for animal to carry around. So it's not uh, surprising that the largest arthropods are found in um, aquatic habitats. So they have this exoskeleton and we see them in the aquatic environment. So when they uh, when they uh, live in this water a column or the uh, aquatic environment, uh, they get this uh, counteract uh, the the weight uh, of these shells are counteract with the buoyancy uh, of water. So buoyancy of water helps for them to uh, keep uh, the body weight in balance. So the body of arthropod is divided into segments generally uh, 
head, thorax, uh, and abdomen. So um, these three main body parts, each body part contains a pair of uh, appendages. So the one that in the head part, um, uh, the mouth part, uh, they're efficient for feeding and they hold uh, sensory structures. So here you can see clearly. So these are the appendages that are used for locomotion. And then are the exterior, I mean, uh, sorry, the, the interior part of the body. So they, they have these appendages modified for sensory structures on feeding. So they, uh, arthropods, they have a highly developed uh, nervous system. So here you can see um, how the uh, blood vessels and the hearts are arranged. And the same way uh, the intestine, and the mouth, it runs in yellow color. The same way the central ganglion, that act, uh, that's kind of the central ganglion is something very similar to our brain. So from that you can see uh, throughout the body the, the, the purple color, the nervous system runs. So the sophisticated sense organs allow them to respond quickly to the changes in the environment. Yes, and then the high degree of development of this arthropod nervous system has um, given rise to number of behaviors like uh, especially we can see uh, if a mosquito is um, there, like when we uh, try to uh, like, when we try to tap, uh, they quickly understand uh, their surrounding and they try to fly away. So this uh, is kind of due to their developed nervous system. So some experiments have shown that uh, these species are capable of uh, learning. So you can understand how, uh, from this you can understand how the, the um, nervous systems are well developed. So when it comes to arthropods, especially uh, they are uh, the marine arthropods, we can divide them into two. Uh, one is chelicerates, um, the other one is mandibulates. So chelicerate here you can see, so first picture is about chelicerates. They have a pair of oral appendages called chelicera here, pair of uh, appendages called chelicerae and they lack mouth parts for chewing uh, food. So they, uh, uh, they lack the mouth part. But when it comes to mandibulates, um, they have um, appendages called mandibles uh, and maxillae. So they help uh, to uh, uptake the food. So that way um, there are two uh, subgroups, the main groups uh, when it comes to marine arthropods. So here first, uh, our first um, example like for chelicerates we can say is horseshoe crabs. So chelicerates um, like they are the primitive group uh, that comes under arthropods. Okay, uh, that includes uh, spiders, uh, ticks, uh, scorpions, uh, horseshoe crabs, and sea spiders. So they are very primitive. These animals have six pairs of appendages. One pair of chelicerae is modified for purpose of feeding. Okay, so here this is sea spider. So they have, you, you can see, 
they have uh, three pairs and one for feeding. So mandibulates have uh, pairs of appendages on the head called mandibles that are modified for feeding. So the mandibulates found in the marine uh, environment are mostly crustaceans, a group uh, represented by a variety of animals that range in size from microscopic zooplankton to large lobsters. So they are very diverse. Some of more important groups of crustaceans found in the marine environment are decapods, mantis streams, krills, copepods, amphipods, and barnacles. So one by one, we'll be uh, studying them. So the first one is mantis stream. So they are highly specialized uh, predators of fish, crabs, shrimps, and mollusks, and many of the distinctive uh, features are related to their predatory behavior. So most uh, mantis shrimps are tropical, but uh, Squilla ampusa is common along the northern American Atlantic coast. The majority of mantis shrimp live uh, in rock or coral surfaces. So they used to live in corals and uh, small holes or surfaces or in burrows uh, excavated in the bottom sediments. So the next is about krills. They are also mandibulates. So these are pelagic ones. They don't live in the bottom but in the water column. So these are small creatures. Uh, they uh, grow up from three centimeters to six centimeters long. Sorry, they are filter feeders and feed uh, primarily on uh, zooplankton. So most uh, species of uh, krill are, are bioluminescent. So here you can see how they appear during night. So they put out some kind of luminescence. So producing light in a specialized organ called photophore. So they have uh, this um, special organ to, to produce this balance. So it's thought that the luminescence is a single to attract individuals into a large mass of swamps. So here in this picture, uh, like what I wanted to emphasize is here you can see how a blue whale, so creels are the sole um, prey for this uh, blue whale. So they are filter feeders. So they feed on uh, this small uh, organisms called creels. So at once they can capture a large number of uh, creels. So tons and tons of creels are taken at once. So that's how uh, these uh, blue whales feed on. So when it comes to krill uh, fishing, um, so when uh, we um, capture krills more, so in that way a human and blue whale are fighting for one particular resource. So krills, um, they, when they become depleted, so blue whales, uh, they don't get enough food. So there is a, um, there should be a balance between how much we, uh, we, uh, we get uh, these resources from our um, ocean. So the next um, uh, example is barnacles. So they are uh, Cedipedia or uh, they are sessile crustaceans. So they can be found attached to rocks, uh, shells, and corals, floating timber, and other solid objectives. So here you can see them. So other barnacles attached to plants or animals, such as whales and large fish, they are attached uh, to the body of these whales and large fish. So the bodies of most barnacles are covered by a shell of uh, calcium carbonate. So here you can see 
these barnacles they are the body uh, is covered by this calcium carbonate so here in this picture it's clear that these white particles are calcium carbonate shells within that these barnacles live so exactly uh, this is the anatomy or the picture that uh, you can uh, clearly see how these feeding legs of cirri are arranged okay so the shell can be attached directly to a hard surface and then the feathery appendages known as cirripedes so these are the feeding legs we call cirri or cirripedes so they extend to water from that shell so shell they cover the body but the cirripedes are directed outward the cirripedes filter food uh, such as microorganism detritus from the water so this is uh, like the water flow so the cirripedes are directed to the water so they can capture the food so the ecological role of these arthropods when we see many crustaceans are food a resource or the food source for other marine animals as well as human so that's uh, the the main um, ecological role we can say so blue crabs or shrimp or lobsters are fished commercially along many parts of this eastern united states and gulf of mexico and other parts of the world as well so other species including the alaskan king crab and snow crab are fished commercially along the pacific coast of the united states so a major so you can understand the the commercial importance of these arthropods so a major part of the diet of many marine animals is copepods the small crustaceans so krills is harvested for human consumption in the water around antarctic and all the other places as well so here the so the uh, as i already um, mentioned so we as human we try to exploit uh, the krill uh, population uh, like being a competitor for the blue whales yes so our next uh, topic we'll be discussing is about a kind of demeter so yes so here you can see a uh, very brightly colored ones are uh, with um, spines actually these echinodermata are uh, they are spiny skinned animals so we'll be studying so these uh, echinodermata so under these we'll be uh, studying about sea stars sea urchin and sea cucumber okay the echinoderm means they are spiny skin so they have uh, the spiny projection uh, all around their body it's thought that the echinoderms evolved from bilateral ancestor called big uh, ancestor because all of the larval forms still exhibit bilateral symmetry so their larval form is bilateral symmetry then the big the adults are radially symmetry so they move uh, towards uh, the radial uh, symmetry may have been an adaptation to sessile lifestyle so we consider about these echinoderms especially they are um, mostly they are attached or they move very slowly from one place to another so when these um, echinoderms they become radially symmetry it's very helpful for them to get the environment uh, in a in an equal way they are exposed to the environment in an equal way so yes here you can see in the first picture is a sea star starfish a sea star we can say then this 
picture is about the brittle star. So clearly you can see the difference from the star, C star and the brittle star. So the third one is about urchin. So the projections are very long. So when it comes to the fourth one is sea cucumber. So they got their name as they um, have the shape of a cucumber. So yes, as I mentioned that they receive the environment equally and echinoderms are mostly benthic, as I already mentioned. They are sometimes attached or they move very slowly uh, in the bottom of this ocean or uh, we can say uh, any the reef flats um, so that way they live uh, attached to the bottom so in fact sea cucumbers and brittle stars are usually the most common form of animal life in deep sea dredging samples so that should be noted so a kinoderm structure so when it comes to uh, echinoderms the first uh, picture that comes to our mind is the spiny skin so that's it so other than that uh, their their body is is uh, made up of small uh, pieces of uh, exoskeleton um yes uh, so uh, sorry the endoskeleton that's uh, composed of a small uh, plates like uh, pieces which is uh, connected to each uh, each plate so when they move uh, these plates can adjust so that way um, they can uh, move very slowly though they have this endoskeleton and also the projection of these spines they come uh, out between these two spines so imagine small plates are there so they are connected so that way it's very helpful for them to move so two plates connected with um, a connective tissue so they can move so and also the projections come out from the uh, joint places so around the bases of the spines are tiny uh, pencil like structures called pedicillaria so yes uh, so there are some uh, like tiny uh, pencil like structures they are called pedicillaria so these structures are found uh, only in some echinoderms not every uh, echinoderms uh, with this are pedicillaria so they keep the surface of their body clean and free of parasites and larvae of various falling uh, falling species in some species they may also aid in obtaining food so pedicillaria are a uh, small uh, projections when it compared to this uh, long spiny projections so small uh, projections they uh, help to keep uh, the, the body of this echinoderms very neat uh, so that way they clean the surface so this is the water vascular system of the echinoderms so it uh, contains uh, the madriporite so the, this like thing which it, which is upward uh, so the aboral side so we, if we take uh, the urchin um, or the sea star, uh, the above part is called aboral part. The down part is called oral part because uh, the mouth is downward, the anus is upward. So this uh, this aboral part. So in the aboral parts, there's a disc-like thing which is connected to the water flow. So that's called medriporite. So this uh, medriporite uh, takes uh, intake the water, pass it through the stone canal, and then that way uh, they go around this ring canal, and then uh, they are distributed to the radial canal. So this um, vesicular system is very much important when it comes to these echinoderms. 
So in the end, very uh, end part of this water vesicular system is connected to tube feeds. So, so tube feed. So that way, uh, this water vesicular system aid in um, the locomotion. So the water vesicular system is a feature that's unique to echinoderm. So we should know that this water vesicular system uh, is only uh, found in echinoderms. So it's a hydraulic system that function in locomotion, as I said, so tube feet, uh, it's very important for their motion and then feeding, gas exchange and excretion. So everything is connected to this uh, water vesicular system of these echinoderms. So water enters the water vesicular system through madriporite um, and they passes all over the earth, all, uh, all, all through the body, through the radial canal and ring canal. So as I already mentioned, this is the aboral part, the upper part, the down part is called the oral part. So here you can see uh, especially um, the, the two rows, in two rows, the tube feet are, tube feet um, are like here you can see, uh, these are the tube feet down. So it's connected to a suck like, uh, like, I'm sorry, the cup like thing. So kind of suckers. So they are called ampullae. So they have these um, ampullae connected tube feet. So that way uh, they adjust the motion. So here the tube feet, uh, they are arranged in two rows. So in between, we call ambulacral groove. So it has a groove. So between uh, two rows of this uh, tube feet, we have this uh, ambulacral groove. So C stars, uh, they are, the, uh, we, uh, like, yes, this is a picture of a C star. Once again, you can have a look at it. So here you can see the spines and they have the five arms, okay? We call the, these uh, arms. So that way, so the sea stars, uh, sea stars move when water is pumped into the tube feet from the ampullae, causing them to project from the ambulacral group. So, so the thing uh, is like when the water is pumped, so they, uh, uh, the ampullae, they contract. So that, that way, uh, the, when the ampullae contract, the tube feet is extended so they can move, okay? So when they want to uh, stop the movement and then the water is pumped uh, upward, so they have this ampulla and the feet. So when this ampulla contract, the feet is elongated so they can move. So when they want to stop their um, movement, then the water is pumped inside the water canal again. So the ampulla is relaxed now and then the feet is shortened. So that way uh, they can um, move uh, from one place to another so yes so when actually uh, when this uh, sea stars they move uh, they exhibit kind of uh, walking type motion from one place to another one place like um, once elongation and then extraction oh the contraction happened so it's shortened so again um elongation so that's how they move so first um, they elongate and then um, upon uh, relaxation the foot uh, is retract uh, re uh, retreated inward so that way it's shortened again um, when the ampullae is contracted the legs are elongated. So that way uh, they move uh, in a walking style. 
So in this picture, it's clear now. Here, see, um, this is the ampullae. So uh, they are, are with circular connective tissue. So that's here they have protractor muscles. So uh, when it's um, contracted, you see, contracted, the legs are becoming elongated. So here you can see uh, the legs are elongated. And from that to there, they move, they move the legs. And then again, this is relaxed. So it's becoming big, not contract, relax. So that way the foot, it's becoming short. So that way they can continue the motion. So majority of sea stars are either carnivores or scavengers. Okay, or else sometimes what they do is they put out their mouth down, like they, their mouth is uh, evert, like everted outwards, and then they produce a digestive um, enzyme and they digest the prey and uptake it. So they show uh, regeneration. I mean, if uh, if one part of the arm is cut uh, or they lost it, so they can regenerate it. So here the ophiroids, uh, so you can call them uh, brittle stars. So brittle stars means like they give kind of brittle uh, feeling so like the disc is uh, like um, it's air yeah, the disc is um, in the mid so the arms are uh, attached uh, separately so the disc is separated from these arms unlike in the sea stars so so they are benthic ones so they move from one place to another a uh, bit faster than the sea star and uh, they have uh, similarly five arms uh, and the spiny projection as well so they have many spines it's um so here you can see the disc and five long fragile it's very um, movable and when uh, like they uh, burrows, uh, but and they live in services, bottom of uh, some services, or they can live inside the sediments. So they put out uh, their arms outwards of the services to capture uh, their food. So especially like if you see um, these brittle stars in, in the Beaches, I mean, the shows are anywhere alive. So <clears throat> usually they put out one or two arms outwards. Uh, they hit other part of their body inside the surfaces or the holes or you can see the sediments. So they put their arms high, high. They call the prey and that way they capture. So if something happens they can disarm they can they can cut off uh, the part they can leave their their arm and move uh, so that's a mechanism that they have so the predator is confused uh, for that uh, lost arm to be this ophiroid or the brittle star so that way uh, they move so here yes uh, the arm is shed so, uh, <clears throat> so later they can uh, regenerate it. So ophiroids can be carnivores, uh, scavengers, uh, deposit feeders, suspension feeders, or fear to feeders. So here you have the basket stars. So it's uh, they are uh, kind of ophiroids, but um, they cover they they usually move uh, on this. Um, surface of rocks, especially or the corals. So that's um, their speciality. So when it comes to basket stars. 
So the tube feeds uh, collect organic particles from bottom sediments, compact them into food balls and move them towards the mouth. So brittle stars are predominantly carnivores, feed largely on polychaetes, uh, mollusks, and small crustaceans. Basket stars are suspension feeders that can capture relatively large zooplankton. They climb up on coral rocks at night and fan their arms towards prevailing water current. So that's what they do, the basket stars. So then the next uh, topic is about sea urchins and their relatives. So today under this, um, a kind, not a kind idea. So we are going to study about the sea urchin, heart urchin and sand ops. So they are the relatives. So sea urchin uh, tend to occupy solid surface such as rocks, um, and they, when they are present in sandy bottom or sandy uh, sand, uh, I mean beach rocks, they uh, try to uh, bury themselves inside the cibuses. So regular uh, echinoids are known as sea urchins. I mean, they they have uh, regular or the radial echinoids. So sea urchins uh, spheroid body is armed with a uh, relatively long movable spine. So so you can uh, you can recall the picture. So sea urchin they are radial, so they are covered with these elongated movable spines. So most are six to twelve centimeters um, long. So Yes, um, and then uh, these animals are ad adapted for burrowing in sand, so they actually uh, burrow the sediments. And unlike sea urchin, the test in this species is covered with many small spines, uh, which are used in locomotion and keep sediments off the body surface. Yes, when it comes to uh, other species, means like the ones, uh, the irregular ones, heart urchins and sand dollars. So they uh, don't have much of these spines. So their tests uh, are covered with many, uh, it said that uh, many, I'm sorry, the, the unlike the urchins, uh, these, the irregular ones, um, the tests are covered with many small spines, not the long ones. So, which is used for locomotion and always uh, that can uh, help them to uh, keep uh, their body surface uh, away from or the keep uh, away from the sediment particles. So, uh, usually this sand dollar, so here you can see it's sand dollar. So, it's very flat. So, this is sea urchin. And this is heart urchin. So these are these two are irregular. This is a regular one. So yes. So this is uh, the structure of uh, echinoid. So here you can see uh, the um, like a boral part. The upper part of the body is with anus. The down one is with mouth. So usually this mouth. Um, Part, they have a special uh, device called Aristotle's lantern. So Aristotle lanterns, uh, they have these uh, five uh, tooth. Uh, so we, actually they are made up of small pyramids, five pyramids. Inside that pyramid they have this tooth. So through that, using that, they graze on these corals, um, seagrass, or seaweed. Um, so they used to uh, use this Aristotle lantern device to graze. So you can see the spines, and they have a very uh, regular, very um, circular tests. 
Um, here uh, you can see the pedicillaria is, uh, I said that there are uh, small projections in the echinoderms. So in echinoid, the sea urchin type, you can see this pedicillaria, very small projections. Here these are long projections are spines, the small projections are pedicillaria. So, and then um, they have this radial canal and then they have these gonads um, and the intestine all over the body. Okay, so here the mouth, this intestine go, go all over the body and then end up in anus. And here madriparoid is present here as well. So through that uh, it pumps the water. So this uh, um, this dark purple color, it's gonad. So five pairs of sorry, five uh, gonads are present uh, inside this uh, shell. So yes, um, and um, there's a uh, um, like. There is, when we uh, take this urchin and uh, have a keen look at the um, shells of the test, we can see uh, the arrangements of these spines. Not every place we can find the spines. So there, there, there are some areas where densely these spines are located. So between the two dense uh, places where the spines are located, we call the middle part ambulacral groove or zone. So that's uh, with this. Um, so especially the spines are uh, for protection, okay? And they contain venom, some species. So when uh, a predator or the human, they come into contact with these spines, they eject, inject uh, venom. So it's, uh, it gives a burning sensation and sometimes it's very deadly. So yes, these spines allow um, some species to live along the shore in region pounded by surf. So actually uh, uh, these urchins, they live in very harsh environment. So other than the uh, protection, actually this is a kind of protection. So uh, it gives a uh, very, um, very um, it makes the water flow easy and give a kind of um, shelter or we can say the protection from this harsh surf uh, that hit uh, on their body and also um, they, they the spines help them for locomotion as well so when it comes to echinoids uh, the sexes are separate female and male okay so yes uh, when the wave hit on their body uh, the energy or the force is being reduced due to these spikes. So that's a kind of mechanism that they have. So the next one is about the sea cucumber. So as I said, they have this uh, name cucumber due to their appearance. So because of their body shape, uh, they lie on one side. So they're cylindrical, okay? And they have these projections all over the bodies, but when it comes to uh, their living, uh, they are always uh, keeping uh, one part of their body uh, touched uh, with the surface. So the ventral tubes are the ones who, are like they are the, like those are the uh, devices they use to uh, move slowly from one place to another. So other than that, the, the sea cucumber, they have uh, this respiratory, um, yes, they have these respiratory trees. So um, they uh, help uh, respiratory trees located in the body cavity. Uh, so they uh, help uh, to Yes, uh, they help uh, for respiration, 
Okay, so feeding uh, in sea cucumber are mainly uh, they are the feeding in sea, when it comes to feeding in sea cucumbers, they are suspension feeders, and they have these oral tentacles, uh, ten to thirty modified tube feet. So their tube feet are modified uh, in the anterior part of their body. We call them oral tentacles. So they, that they can capture food using that oral tentacles and these tentacles are coated with sticky mucus. So small uh, organisms, they are stuck. So sea cucumbers retreat their tentacles. So this is uh, the interior part. So in this picture, I think I can show you, uh, yes, this way. So the tube feed, uh, they are elongated small tentacles. So they uh, put that out and collect the food and put, uh, the, like they retract the tentacles into their mouth. Then they can digest the organic material, leaving conspicuous mounds of sand and fecal mud casting behind. So that's uh, about the sea cucumber. Many uh, sedentary species that live on hard surfaces or beneath stones are suspension feeders. So when uh, they have uh, this mechanism, so when they are disturbed, so when we uh, try to uh, touch them sometimes, they uh, put out their covarian tibials. Okay, so that's uh, kind of very sticky. They come out, so here you can see. So when they're stressed, when we try to catch them sometimes very tightly, so they, uh, they think that uh, they are being attacked. So they put all these uh, cuvarian tubules out, which is very sticky. So sometimes uh, small uh, something, uh, predators, they get entangled in this. Um, so this behavior helps a uh, slow moving sea, sea cucumber deter potential predators. So this is a kind of mechanism. So when the predator is entangled, they can escape quickly. So that's uh, the mechanism. So yes. So the last one is about the crinoids. So they are feather stars, okay? They look like flowers attached mostly, very slow uh, motion. I mean, they, they are sedentary. So sessile sea uh, lilies may reach a length of one meter. They can grow. So yes, um, so here you can see these are sea lilies. Um, so they are uh, like free living crinoids uh, whose habitat ranges from intertidal zone to great depths and some occur in large numbers on coral reefs. So sometimes uh, they, are, uh, they are mostly seen in uh, coral uh, cor with, uh, in association with coral reefs as well. So feather stars uh, are free moving, so they can be sessile and they can move uh, like, yes, they swim and crawl, uh, crawl uh, only for short distances. So that's very important. So they show some very uh, slow or small um, movements so they can swim but very short distance the they cling uh, to the bottom for long periods by means of this grasping cirri many of these shallow water species are nocturnal they feed on feed during night crinoids are suspension feeders so they have these um, uh, feathers or uh, tentacles so they feed on small organisms that are filtered from the water by their tube feet and mucus uh, nets by these umbilical grooves. So 
yes the lost arms uh, in then they also can be regenerated so if they lose any arm uh, so that can be regenerated so after a free swimming stage the larvae uh, settle on the bottom and attach so that their larvae are free living free swimming so they can get attached this is followed by a metamorphosis, metamorphosis resulting in the formation of uh, mini crinoids so when it comes to uh, ecological roles of this echinoderms so because of their spiny skins uh, echinoderms are not preyed by many organisms that's one big advantage they get from being a spiny skinned organism some mollusks and sea otters eat sea urchin and sea stars many spider crabs feed on echinoderms which they tear apart uh, crush with their uh, chelipedes humans eat sea urchin especially uh, the gonads sea cucumber and some fish have mouth parts modified for feeding on echinoderms so uh, in reef uh, the parrot fish uh, they are modified to eat these kind of uh, urchins and the hard shells so on the other hand many uh, many uh, echinoderms are predators of mollusks other echinoderms nidarians and crustaceans so the last one is about the crown of thorn starfish acanthesteplensi is a major predator of coral so this is uh, another echinoderm so this uh, is this um, echinoderm voraciously prey on corals so if acanthester uh, plansy is there in the coral reef means um, it's the end of uh, the coral like it, like they can't survive because they feed very fast okay so excessive population of sea urchins have become a nuisance by robbing lobsters trap so yes so acanthester plansy uh, is the major predator of corals okay so then um, sea cucumber beds have been depleted uh, and fishes have begun to threaten beds of uh, south america and galapagos islands in the future sea cucumbers may be collected as a source of medicine so when it comes to uh, this uh, it said that the poison uh, when when collect uh, when we can collect uh, through a cart has various effect on nerve and muscle and also suppress the growth of certain tumors so that way uh, they can be a source of medicine as well the sea cucumbers so so we have reached uh, the end of today's session so i hope that you all enjoyed learning about arthropod and echinoderms so in the next class uh, we'll be covering about vertebrates thanks for joining bye bye